Breathe in, breathe out. Now, as your circulatory system brings that oxygen to your brain, let's look at gas exchange. Be able to define heart, open circulatory system, hemolymph, closed circulatory system, blood, arteries, capillaries, veins, atria, ventricles, single circulation, double circulation, gas exchange, partial pressure, ventilation, trachea, and lungs. Compare circulatory system in animals. Compare respiratory systems in animals. Identify how respiratory and circulatory specializations allow gas exchange and relate gas exchange to homeostasis. You may note if you're looking in your book that we are skipping a lot of anatomy here and a lot of physiology. Remember, this is a comparative anatomy course with an emphasis on evolution, not an organismal biology course. As we look at different methods of gas exchange and circulation, remember that form and function are going to be governing this, and the needs of the organism are going to be coming first. In this axolotl, which is an aquatic organism, we can see the high surface area and the very red coloration of these external gills. The gas exchange is occurring across the gill membrane with carbon dioxide being lost to the environment and oxygen being taken up. And the circulation, all that blood there, is going to be bringing the oxygen to the rest of the body. It is notable that these are gills, they are external, and this is an amphibian. Not all organisms are going to require complex respiratory and circulatory systems. For organisms that are only one cell, or for organisms that are only a few cells thick, simple diffusion will work sufficiently to bring oxygen to all cells in the body. And this is why things like hydras are not going to have lungs, gills, or a heart. These single celled organisms, as an amoeba would be, or most protists, are also not going to need multicellular things to bring oxygen around. And that gastrovascular cavity can actually pump water in and out, which can enable a faster exchange. When we look at circulatory systems, we are going to classify them as either open circulatory systems or closed circulatory systems. An open circulatory system has fluid pumped by a heart, but does not have extensive vessels going to all the parts of the body. Instead, they have something called hemolymph, which function both as lymph, which manages to maintain hydrostatic pressure within the organism, and as blood, bringing nutrients and bringing oxygen around the body. A closed circulatory system will have fluid pumped by a heart into pressurized vessels, and this can allow for more efficient exchange of oxygen because oxygen is exchanged more efficiently when it is in a fluid under pressure. And in the case of closed circulatory system, the blood and the lymph are kept separate from one another. Now, let's look at the different types of vessels that are present in a closed circulatory system. First off, we have arteries, and you can remember that the A in artery means away. Arteries lead away from the heart. Capillaries are at the end of the arteries and are where gas exchange occurs. This can be both in the lungs and in the remainder of the body. And veins will bring blood back to the heart. The pressure in these vessels is going to be highest in the arteries. Veins are going to have blood at very low pressure and often low oxygenation unless they are the veins returning blood from the lungs to the heart. And speaking of the heart, we have two different types of chambers in the heart. First off are the atria, the right atrium and the left atrium. These are going to collect blood from the veins. The veins empty into the atria and the atria will pump blood into the ventricles. The ventricles are going to have more musculature and are going to pump blood under higher pressure either to the pulmonary circuit, including the lungs, or to the systemic circuit, including the rest of the body. Now, I just said two circuits, and that's something called double circulation. So let's take a look at what double circulation is and why not all organisms have it. In fact, fish will have something called single circulation. In single circulation, there is only one atrium and one ventricle. The atrium collects blood from the veins, pumps it to the ventricle, the ventricle pumps blood to the arteries, and those are going to go to the gills first. From the gills, they are going to go to the rest of the body to deliver oxygen to the rest of the body tissues. An advantage of this is its simplicity. A disadvantage of this is that it gives lower pressure for the body capillaries because you're not pumping it twice. However, it should be notable that the vessels going from the gill capillaries to the body capillaries can be put under pressure if they run through active muscles because muscles can also be pumping blood. 
we have double circulation in both amphibians and mammals. Note that in the amphibians, there is only one ventricle, and that ventricle is going to pump things on both sides, giving double circulation, but under a single pressure-causing ventricle. Whereas in mammals, there are two separate ventricles. The left ventricle is going to be more muscular because it is pumping blood to everywhere in the body except the lungs. And the right ventricle is going to be a little less muscular because it's only pumping to the lungs. This allows blood to be at high pressure in both systemic and pulmonary circuits, allowing for more efficient oxygen exchange in the capillaries of both circuits. What governs gas exchange? Well, diffusion at the small scale. Although I am talking about the movement of blood throughout the body, when we get down to the nitty and the gritty of capillaries and what they're exchanging with, we can see how capillaries are going to have diffusion of oxygen from either an alveolus into the capillary or from the capillary into active cells. And that determined, that's determined by partial pressure. This means that cells that are actively moving around, such as your muscles when you are exercising, are going to have a higher oxygen demand. Circulatory system is going to deliver oxygen at a higher level and a higher rate to cells when diffusion is going to be higher due to that higher demand. The thickness of the membrane also matters, which is why you do not get a lot of movement of oxygen out of your arteries. The concentration differential matters. As I said, a lower amount of oxygen will end up allowing the capillaries to put more oxygen into those cells. And of course, there's the fluid pressure. As I mentioned, if you have capillaries under higher pressure, like you do in double circulation, you're going to get more efficient exchange. And if you have this in a closed system, you're going to get more efficient exchange. Looking at the different types of respiratory anatomy, we have, first off, external gills. The gills are going to be directly in contact with the external water. This, however, does cause a bit of a risk of injury. And if you're looking at that sea star and thinking, I didn't know they had the external gills, that's because they are pretty well protected. Take it to an extreme in a sea urchin where you have those spines protecting the gills. Movement of the organism will increase the gas exchange and the movement of these gills outside of the organism can increase the gas exchange. So things like this marine worm will actually move their gills around. Internal gills require ventilation. This is the movement of water over those gills. There are two different forms of ventilation in fish. First off is ram ventilation, where the fish swims forward with its mouth open. As it does so, it's going to move water over its gills. The next form is pumping, where the fish is going to open and close its mouth and actively pump the water over the gills. This allows a fish to sit still and to be able to pump the water as it just sits still. It doesn't have to keep swimming in order to keep moving water over the gills. And we can see here counter current exchange in this figure. There is counter current exchange as the water moves over the gills. You start with the water with the highest partial pressure of oxygen, encountering the blood that is already enriched in oxygen. This allows movement of oxygen from the water into the blood. And as the water moves across that capillary, it will always have a higher partial pressure of oxygen in the water than in the blood. And that allows this countercurrent exchange to take place. And of course, these gills being internal, there can still be gill parasites if they manage to swim in there. And we can take a look at some of those uh, next time you catch a fish. Arthropods use trachea as well, especially land-dwelling arthropods. These are air tubes that are throughout the organism. They are very small and they go down to every single cell. So every cell is close to a trachea. The movement of an organism is actually going to pump the blood over the trachea, is over the cells, and actually is going to move some of these gas sacs in order to pump air in and out. Thus, as the organism moves faster, not only does the blood pump faster, but the trachea move air faster. So as respiratory demand goes up as this grasshopper hops around, so too does the movement of the hemolymph and the movement of the gas. This doesn't work well for large organisms because of how much distance the air has to actually travel. It's much more efficient to have something like lungs in large organisms. And lungs are basically large air sacs with these small alveoli where capillaries can take up oxygen. These alveoli are kind of the cul-de-sacs of the roads that are the bronchioles. 
and this can allow the capillaries to vascularize these alveoli, and that's where your gas exchange is going to occur. There are two different ways of filling your lungs. First is positive pressure ventilation used in amphibians, where they just swallow the air into their lungs. Negative pressure ventilation is what is used in mammals, and that is where the diaphragm goes down, the intercostal muscles go out, and the amount of volume in the lungs expands. As volume expands in a gas, the pressure decreases in the gas, and this pulls in air from the external environment. In birds, it's not sacs, they're actually, they actually have tubes. And if you want to take a look at the anatomy of bird lungs, it's beautiful, wonderful, and a little more complicated than we're going to get to in this lecture. We should also note that in mammals, especially mammals that run around on four limbs, like most mammals, the movement of the gut forward compresses the lungs when animals are running. Last, let's look at respiratory homeostasis. As carbon dioxide enters the blood, as an organism gets more active, it will generate more carbon dioxide that will go into the blood, and that is going to reduce the pH of the blood because the carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid, and that is going to lower the pH. There are sensors in the major blood vessels detecting the decrease in blood pH, as well as a sensor in the medulla of the brain that will detect the decrease in pH of the cerebral spinal fluid that interacts with the brain. As the medulla receives signals from the major blood vessels and from the cerebral spinal fluid around it, it is going to activate a response, sending signals to the rib muscle and the diaphragm, which will increase the rate and depth of breathing. This causes the blood CO2 level to decrease as blood CO2 turns into CO2 in the air as you breathe it out, which will also cause the blood pH to rise back to homeostasis. So it is notable that the body is not measuring oxygen for respiratory homeostasis, but is measuring carbon dioxide.